Hello aviators, how are you today? My name is Magnar Nordahl, I'm a captain and instructor on ATR aircraft. Last month, Maldivian received the first ATR-72s. More ATR aircraft are on order, and they will replace the company's aging the Havilland Canada Dash 8. This video is about the Dash 8, and we will start with the history of the company. The Havilland was a successful British aircraft manufacturing company. In 1928, they set up the Havilland Aircraft of Canada Limited in Toronto. The purpose was to build the DH-60 MOT aircraft. Later on, the company built the DH-82 Tiger MOT, DH-83 Fox MOT, and during the Second World War, the Mosquito fighter bomber. After the war, the Havilland Canada started to build their own designs. First came the Chipmunk, primary retainer. First flown in 1946, it served with military and civilian operators all over the world. This one was used by the Royal Thai Air Force. Then followed a series of aircraft designed for short field operations. First flown in 1947, the Beaver was a Bush airplane that could be equipped with wheels, skis or floats. It was powered by a Pratt & Whitney radial engine. The aircraft is still in service and some of them are converted to feature a turboprop engine. The Otter was a larger development of the Beaver and was produced from 1951 to 1967. The first twin-engine aircraft was the Caribou. It was produced from 1958 to 1968. This aircraft served the Royal Malaysian Air Force from 1966 until 2000. In 1964, the Havilland Canada introduced the Buffalo. It had a T-tail and turboprop engines, and it could carry much more payload than a Caribou, while having better performance. However, it didn't sell well. Attempts were made to sell the Buffalo as a civilian transport. During a demonstration flight at Farnborough Show in 1984, it made a heavy landing. The pilots walked away, but the civilian Buffalo project ended here. Then followed the Twin Otter. First flown in 1965, the aircraft is a single-engine Otter equipped with two turboprop engines. The largest operators of Twin Otter are in the Maldives. I have made some videos about the seaplane operations and you will find the links below. In 1975, the company introduced the Dash 7, a 50-seat regional airliner with pressurized cabin. It was optimized for short runways. In Norway, for example, it was operated by Widerö on 800 meter long runways. However, the aircraft was slow and four engines made it expensive to maintain. Eight years later, the Havilland Canada introduced the Dash 8. It had the same cabin cross section and tail as the Dash 7. It got a new nose, wings and engines. It became a commercial success with more than 1000 units sold. The Dash 8 was built in four variants. The 100 was the shortest, with up to 37 passenger seats. The 200 has the same airframe and more powerful engines, making it perfect for hot and high conditions. The 300 is a stretched version with up to 56 passenger seats. And then follow the 400, which is a very different bird. In 1986, the Havilland Canada was sold to Boeing, and they kept the company until 1992, when um, the Havilland Canada was sold to Bombardier, who took over the production. The last Dash 8100 was delivered in 2005, and the production of the 200 and 300 ended in 2009. In 2006, Viking Air purchased the type certificates for every model from the Dash 1 to the Dash 7. And in 2019, Viking Air took over the Dash 8 program as well. At the same time, a new de Havilland Aircraft Company of Canada was formed. 
The company will produce the CL-515 firefighting aircraft, the Twin Otter and the Dash 8400, while supporting the other models. This is a Dash 8300 belonging to Moldavian. Starting with the entrance door, it doesn't touch the ground. On one of the steps, there's a storage room for gear pins and covers. Moving forward, we have the angle of attack sensor and the pitot tube for captain's speed indicator. Those holes are for the static ports, one for each altimeter. Checking the avionics compartment. And below is the main battery. This hatch has a little surprise. I will come back to it later in the video, so stay tuned. Below are hatches for ground intercom and DC ground power. Below is an air intake for cooling of the avionics. This might be a DME antenna. Inside the nose cone is a weather radar. The nose gear has two wheels and a taxi light. When it came to the right side, my camera decided to strike, but thankfully it changed its mind and started to work again. The green disc shows that the oxygen bottle is full. Here are the right side static ports and the pitot tube for the first officer's airspeed indicator and the angle of attack sensor. This is a service point for the lavatory. This is a full-sized emergency exit. It is opposite of the main entrance door. The engine is a Pratt & Whitney 123 driving a four-bladed propeller. Depending on the engine variant, it develops 2380 or 2500 horsepower. The landing lights are in the wing roots. This is the exhaust duct from the engine. Normally the aft main landing doors are closed, but they are open to allow for access for maintenance. This is done by pulling a lever behind this panel in the cockpit. The flaps are now in full down position. The aft part of the right engine nacelle has a refueling point and refueling panel. Underneath the aft emergency exit is an inflatable device called the ditching dam. It is deployed after landing in water and is intended to prevent water from entering the cabin. It is inflated with pressurized nitrogen. 
This is the service door with access to the galley. The APU is installed in the tail cone. The exhaust port is on this side and the air intake is in the tail. As you can see, the rudder has two parts. Together do they form a curved profile, which is more efficient than a single surface. The rudder is operated with hydraulic power. The other flight controls, elevators and ailerons are manually operated. The dolphin on the tail is really beautiful. And the black antenna is for the VOR and localizer. The cargo door opens upwards. Here are indicators for the engine fire bottles. There are two bottles in all and they can be used for either engine. The red disc will disappear if one of the bottles has been discharged by the pilots. The amber disc will disappear if one or both bottles have been discharged for other reasons. Here you can see one of the jack screws that moves the flaps. This is the oil cooler, and here is the engine bypass door. The pilot will select it open when there is a risk for ice, water or foreign objects that can be sucked into the engine air intake. When looking into the engine air intake, you can see that the engine is located above the air intake duct. The old cooler and bypass door are further aft and below. And we are back to the entrance door, so let's get inside. The cockpit is typical for the 1980s, with two FE screens, the rest of the instruments are analog. Each pilot has a panel with six flight instruments, including the two screens. Each pilot also has a screen showing the flight director modes, air temperature and true airspeed. Here are the standby flight instruments. They consist of artificial horizon and altimeter. The aircraft doesn't have a standby airspeed indicator. In the middle are the primary engine instruments, torque, propeller speed and ITT. Next we have the secondary engine instruments, showing the RPM of the turbine shafts, fuel flow, engine oil pressure and temperature, and fuel temperature. This indicator shows the temperature of the left fuel tank. Below is the fuel control panel. The aircraft has one fuel tank in each wing. The total capacity is 835 US gallons or 3160 liters. The transfer switch allows for transfer of fuel from one tank to the other. 
The engine controls are found on both sides of the fuel panel. With the engine ECU selector, you can choose takeoff, maximum continuous, climb and cruise power. In most aircraft with this engine, a computer calculates maximum torque for each setting, displaying it as a berg on the torque indicator. But this aircraft doesn't have this berg and the pilots are using a table to find the torque for the current conditions. On the right side are the controls for the auto feather system. When taking off, the auto feather system is armed and will feather the propeller in case of an engine failure. At the same time, will engine torque increase automatically on a good engine, causing this light to illuminate. Here are the push buttons that control the engine intake bypass doors. And here are the controls for the hydraulic system. This is the switch for the propeller synchrophaser, and this is the switch for the brakes anti-skid. This is the landing gear lever and indicator. And this panel shows the position of powered flight control surfaces. The rudder and the spoilers are powered by hydraulic power. They can be disabled with those push buttons. The yellow handles are used in case pitch control or roll control is jammed. By pulling the handle, the control link between the two pilots' control columns is separated, and one of the pilots will have control of the aircraft. Below is a panel for internal communication. This is the FMS where the flight plan is inserted. The primary navigation aid is GPS. Those controls are, if I'm correct, for the directional gyro. Below are the control panels for the airfields and between them is the weather radar. Then we have the pitch trim wheels with an indicator on the left side. There is no electrical pitch trim. This is the parking brake lever, power levers, and this is the gust lock lever for the flight controls. And condition levers, which are used to start and stop the engines and to control propeller speed. Finally, we have the flaps lever. The flaps indicator is here. Further aft, we have VHF radios, transponder, ADF, which are not used very much anymore, audio control panels, HF radio and trims for ailerons and rudder. On the glare shield, do we find clocks, annunciate panels for navigation sources, controls for stick pusher and ground proximity warning system. The flight director and autopilot are controlled with this panel. On each side are controls for VOR and ILS navigation. And each pilot has knobs used to set the course and heading bag on HSI. Here is the red warning light and the amber caution light. They start to flash when there is a system failure, triggering alert lights located in a panel over the windscreen. On the left side of the overhead panel, we have the control for the windshield heating and wipers. This is the control panel for ice protection. And we have the control panels for DC electrical power here. On the second row, do we have external lights, cabin pressure indicators, flight data recorder, and battery temperature. Next panel, more external lights, cabin pressurization control, engine start panel, APU control, and panel lights. Above is the control panel for APU and engine fire. The last row has cabin signs. Then we have the air conditioning panel and AC electrical power panel. Okay, then we have the basic understanding of the aircraft and just one detail remains. During the walk around, I promise to tell you what is behind this hatch. It is the nose gear lock. On other aircraft types, you attach a pin in the landing gear strut, preventing the strut from collapsing when the aircraft is towed. On the Dash 8, the nose gear doesn't have a pin. Instead, you open this panel and pull and rotate the handle to lock and unlock the nose gear. And that's all for this time. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day and happy learning.